welcome. I'm going to speak loudly because I know there's people at the back. I'm super excited to see so many people interested in our technology here. I mean, I love it, but I thought it was just me. But this is <laughs> clearly going to make a great case for next year when we ask for a bigger space. So thank you all for getting my tweet. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So I'm just going to quickly open up and then hand over to Mark. Uh, so my name is John Wordsworth. As Marlin said, a doctor, not that it matters. And I've been at Paradox for five years. Somehow I've survived in Stockholm and still not grown the hipster beard, which I'm pretty happy about. Um, and I started off my programming career by modding Quake a long time ago. Uh, and it makes me sad to see people here sometimes who don't even know what that is. So um, I am a nerd, though, so I expect a little bit less uh, showmanship and a bit more nerdiness. But I think we're in the right room for that. So. Definitely. Over to you. That was my oh, right. slide. So. Hey, and that was the slide I was supposed to have up while I was saying yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So. If you didn't know, that's what his face looks like. <laughs> that's yours. Thank you very much. Okie dokie. So, yes, uh, thank you very much, guys. This is amazing. <laughs> uh, there's so many people in this room, way more than I was expecting. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay. And everyone can see the screen. So, that's what I look like. Uh, I'm Mark. <laughs> I'm uh, engine team lead, as John said. Uh, I'm from Scotland. Uh, I've been with Paradox for three years. And uh, I also haven't grown a beard. <laughs> um, I, I'm originally come from uh, networking and telecoms, so more of an infrastructure uh, background. This is my first uh, games industry job, and it's been absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, I've learned a lot at Paradox in my, in my three years so far there. Um, Sweden and Stockholm are amazing. I've really enjoyed moving there. I originally lived uh, just outside of Edinburgh in Scotland, and uh, I'm also a pilot. It's, uh, it's something that I tend to tell people within about the first 30 seconds of meeting them. Uh, <laughs> it means that I really enjoy procedure, uh, checklists, uh, and I also have a YouTube channel. <laughs> Check out Deepak if you're interested in seeing any flight simulation videos, uh, tutorials, that kind of stuff. Uh, so, next slide. I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the history of Clausewitz. Uh, so I'm going to show you, uh, I'm basically going to go over very quickly what we're going to be covering so that you guys know, uh, you know what this journey involves, so that nobody has to ask me, are we there yet? Uh, I'm going to talk about Europa, which a lot of people might not have heard of even. We're going to talk about Clausewitz, which is the actual point of this entire talk. Uh, I'm also going to show you the timeline from the pre uh, all the way up to the present day, from the earliest days of our engine development at uh, Paradox. Uh, and I'm then, at the very end, going to talk to you uh, about the team that create the engine. So, but before I start, a disclaimer. Uh, I've only been here for three years at Paradox, not the 11 years that Clausewitz has been in development. So uh, a lot of stuff happened before my time. You know, I wasn't there. I don't know anything about it. However, in preparation for this talk, I've conducted a fair amount of research. I've interviewed all of the people who've been at the company much longer than I have, spoken to some of the people, in fact, who were there at the very beginning of Clausewitz development and before. Yep, I'm still on the right slide. <laughs> I'm going to be as accurate as possible, but please remember that inaccuracies are possible. But I'm doing my best. I also don't do talks very often, so I'm a little bit nervous. So be kind. <laughs> Let's begin. <laughs> Thank you. So, in the beginning, the Europa engine, the year 2000, uh, it, came, it came out uh, with the game uh, Europa Universalis. Now, if you look at Wikipedia, it says that Paradox has only ever had two game engines, Europa and Clausewitz. However, when I was interviewing some of the older, uh, older hands at the company, uh, specifically Johan Andersson, he told me that there really never was a Europa engine, per se. Uh, Europa was more of a kind of branding term that we used for our earlier games. Uh, the code was copy-pasted from one project to the next. <laughs> so you know, Europa Universalis is kind of the birth of the Europa engine, but the subsequent games really just had chunks of Europa Universalis copied <laughs> into them, stuff deleted, and then they made a new game around that. So. Um, uh, Johan was very, very specific in that Europa Engine does not exist. But for the purposes of this talk, it does. Um, Wikipedia has an article about it, so it must be real. <laughs> it's a 2D game engine created with grand strategy games in mind. Six of Paradox's earliest games were released on this engine. Uh, it has, uh, the functionality is that it has hand-drawn 2D maps, as you can see here, in all of their beauty. 
uh, and a dizzying 256 colours on screen <laughs> at one time. Uh, it's, it's amazing, absolutely resplendent. So this engine was used, as I say, in the original Europa Universalis, released in the year 2000. It was also used uh, the next year, 2001, in Europa Universalis 2. Uh, in 2002, the original Hearts of Iron was on Europa engine. In 2003, we had Victoria. Anyone ever heard of that game? <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. <laughs> Crusader Kings, the original Crusader Kings in 2004. And in the very final Europa engine game, which is not an engine, uh, Hearts of Iron 2 in 2005. But we don't care about that. That's not why we're here. We care about Clausewitz, the arrival of Carl von Clausewitz. In 2007, released uh, with, the Europa, uh, with Europa Universalis 3, which is the image that you're seeing here, was the Clausewitz engine. However, part of the reason that I'm here is to dispel inaccuracies in the public record when it comes to Paradox and the Clausewitz engine. Everybody thinks that Europa Universalis 3 was the first Clausewitz game, but that's not true. Has anyone ever heard of a little game called Diplomacy? <laughs> okay, so this is 2007. Actually, all the way back in 2005, Diplomacy was released, complete with 3D portraits, no less. Uh, and that's something we'll come back to a little bit later on. But uh, Wikipedia states that Europa Universalis 3 was the first Clausewitz game, but we, we now know that's lies. Um, so, Clausewitz, what does it bring? Well, as you can see on screen here, it was the first of our games to include a three-dimensional map and three-dimensional units uh, with animations. Uh, you can also see that way more of the screen space is now taken up by the map. Uh, if we jump back to Europa a little <laughs> for a moment very, very quickly, you can see that actually there's a whole load of UI going on on the left. Clausewitz, way more map. We like a bit of map in our games. Uh, more unit animations, as I said, uh, and it was the start of a, a brand new development, a brand new engine, and the, the development of which continues today. So this is where our story starts. So the very first commit, 28th of May 2008, Besichov, as you can see here, our very own uh, Thomas Johansson. And um, that's actually not, you know, the, the development of Clausewitz actually began a bit earlier than that. It began in 2004. However, this is the earliest commit that I can actually dig up. Um, you know, but <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what kind of uh, version control system they were using back in those days, but uh, we've gone through different ones. Setups have changed. This is as far back as I can go. Also, you'll notice that back in those days, it wasn't fashionable to actually have commit messages. So we only <laughs> really know what's in this commit by looking uh, looking at the directory structure, and so that's why I did a little ls there. Um, so yeah, empty commit messages. We had a lot of those when I was going going back through the the repo and doing my research. So at this stage, 2008, we have 107,000 lines of C++ code in Clausewitz, and that's across eight modules. And we're going to see how that develops over time. So I'm going to give you a timeline and screenshots by. I don't know why I keep looking there when I have a screen here. Uh, I'm going to show you a timeline and screenshots without actually having any screenshots on this particular slide. Uh, so we're going to journey through the screenshots. We're going to show you different Clausewitz games over the years, because that's the best way to show you the improvements that have come in different versions of the Clausewitz engine. Because the engine itself doesn't really do very much, or at least not very much, that you can see without a game. Uh, I'm also going to give you a whole load of facts about its development over time. OK. so. Let's jump forwards to 2012 and Crusader Kings 2. Uh, significant progress, as you can probably see even just by looking at the screenshot. It's the first of our games uh, to make use of the new OSX support in Clausewitz, which, which was developed at this time. Our previous games, I think pretty much all of them as far back as I can remember, had OSX support. However, they were ported by third-party developers. This was the first time when we got OSX for free, in effect, because it was uh, supported in the engine itself. And then Linux support came one year late. Oh, <laughs> woo! <laughs> Linux support came one year later in 2013. Uh, many graphical tweaks, as you can probably see from this screenshot as well. Big upgrades with regards to the textures and to the lighting. This is also during the, the development time of Crusader Kings 2. This is when the engine team was 
sort of first formed. Uh, it seems that <laughs> the history back then is a little bit fuzzy. People disagree. But uh, some people claim that's when the engine team was formed, with one person, I might add. Uh, prior to that, basically all development in the engine was done by all developers working on the games. So everyone chipped in, you know, made features for their games, and uh, then, I guess, put it into Klauswitz. Uh, at this time also, we had no build team. Uh, that's something that happened a little bit later. Uh, also, during the development of this game, uh, it was not possible to reload modules. So if you were doing things like editing the UI, that required you to edit the UI files, quit the game, start it again, which if you know our games, you know that sometimes loading time can be a factor. Um, if you have to do that a couple of hundred times a day while developing the UI, uh, it's going to get a bit old. So that's, that's how things were done back then, though. So, and uh, in the case of CK2, we can already see that uh, things have developed a little bit with regards to the code. We're up to 135,000 lines of C++ at this point, 18 modules. And uh, when I checked the repo, 19 different contributors to that code base at that particular time. That's 2012. So now, into space. Stellaris. Yay, everyone likes <laughs> Stellaris. Uh, 2016. Again, a lot has changed at this point. There's no map. How can you have a Clausewitz-based game with no map? A lot of artifacts in that screenshot. Um, yes, no map. Uh, this was also the very last of our games to have the, the GUI version 1, uh, which had first came out with Europe Universalis 3. Uh, the version 2 of the GUI system was developed at about the same time as Stellaris, but it wasn't ready in time. And so Stellaris charged on with version 1. Uh, it has a whole load of new graphical features, though, which you may not see from this uh, screenshot, but uh, we got PBR, whatever that means. We got Bloom, uh, we got support for UTF-8, and we got true type fonts, all of which combined made it a much prettier game than previous Klauswitz games. Uh, we also got the Observer mode, which first appeared in EU4, made its way into Klauswitz at that time. So, Stellaris. Big jump forwards, <laughs> I guess, when you've got all of those nice graphical features, it uh, results in some lines of code. Uh, at this point, in, with Stellaris 2016, we're at 228,000 lines of C++. Uh, we've got 35 different modules in the game and 28 contributors uh, when we check through the repo. And now we return to Rome with Imperator Rome in 2019. Uh, so. Again, quite a lot of improvements. You can probably see again, just by looking at the screenshot, uh, how much better it looks graphically than previous Clausewitz-based games. Uh, we get One of the big things we get with this version is individual trees, because people, people love trees. Uh, now, this, this, is <laughs> this was one of those things where performance was actually a real factor, uh, and a lot of optimization had to be done to allow us to draw so many of these individual trees on the map. Uh, and that's something that was uh, uh, you know, very nicely tweaked for this particular game release. Uh, it's also sh uh, this is also the time when we got roads. Uh, you know, I believe that the Romans built some roads, so we needed to add that functionality into Klauswitz. You'll also see, if you take a little look at the water there, uh, the water shader has uh, seen some significant improvements and is looking very tasty. Uh, it's also, I, was, I said I was going to mention this again, this is also when we implemented 3D portraits. You might say, wait a sec, we heard 3D portraits were in diplomacy. What happened? I have no idea. But uh, <laughs> I can only assume the portraits in that system were either static or they were game side. But we only got 3D portrait support in Klauswitz uh, with Imperator Rome. Um, public tools. This was the first game to publicly release the tools for modders. Uh, and actually, these are the very same tools that we use in-house to make the game. So this was, a, this was a massive improvement, especially for the modders. Um, this is also actually when the test automation team was formed. And during the development of Imperator Rome, a lot of automated tests were run, uh, in particular with the multiplayer. Uh, and this was a, a really good way of ironing out very hard to find bugs. Debugging multiplayer sessions is quite a hard thing to do. And if you can automate it and repeat it and run them often, you get a much better, more stable result. So here we are, Klauswitz in 2019. We've got 251,000 lines of C++, 52 modules, and 51 contributors listed in the repo. Um, so yeah, <laughs> a, bit of a, a bit of a growth from the previous ones. 
So that brings me on to two very quick topics that I want to touch on. They're sort of in depth, but I wanted to mention them very quickly. Code complexity. What happens when you increase, all, <laughs> increase the, the complexity of your code? You generate all these new lines of code, but each line of code has, a, has many costs uh, associated with it. It costs you to implement that code in the first instance. It costs you to maintain that code. Uh, and actually, the next time you go to implement something, you've got a further cost. And all of these costs scale uh, with the, the increasing size of the code base. So this is something that's very tough for us to manage. Uh, also, technical debt. Every specific solution steals uh, development time from uh, future development. And uh, it means that uh, you know, if you're having to very, very quickly deliver specific solutions for particular games, um, you know, it's, it's going to be more difficult to develop the next specific solution. But anyway, I won't bore you too much with that. And so the very last thing I'm going to tell you all about, uh, the team, the team who make the engine. Today, we've got a team called PDS Tech, and it contains a series of sub-teams within it. Uh, we've got the engine team. They're, they're uh, involved in developing Klauswitz, that we've just been talking about, but also Jomini, which John's going to touch on in, in just a moment. Uh, we also have a sub-team called Tools, and funnily enough, they develop the tools that we release to help modders create their mods, but also uh, they're used internally by the studio to create the games in the first instance. The build team, who are responsible for compiling the games, ensuring that they, they get deployed to the different distribution channels. Uh, and then finally, we have test automation, which I just mentioned, who are running the automated tests that ensure the highest possible quality of the games. And they, that goes hand in hand with uh, manual QA. So that's all of my slides. Nice. I'm now going to hand over to John. And he's going to tell you a little bit more about the technical side. Awesome. Thank you ever so much, Mark. That was super cool. Thank you. OK, cool. I'm super excited to talk about the tech. That's great to know about history. And I like history, but I, I really love tech. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about now. Uh, I hope a super quick show of hands before I get started. How many people in this room would consider themselves a programmer? OK, cool, cool. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe there's some of the same people, but how many of you are modders in this room? Yeah, of, of our games or any games? But yeah, cool. Awesome. So lots of programmers in here. That's great. It's going to get a little bit nerdy. And I've realized I've got quite a few slides and not all that much time. So I will speak quick, but there will be time after this talk that we can talk in more detail if you want to. So. Um, so I'm going to kick off. We're going to talk about four things. Uh, I'm just going to go over very quickly what a game engine actually is, what, what makes a game like, work and work on your screen. Then I'm going to talk about Klauswitz, go into some details what makes up Klauswitz as a whole, and then some highlights from the last couple of years. Then I'm going to break down just what happens in a frame and a ground strategy game. And then I'll go through some frequently asked questions if I have time. So uh, what is a game engine? I think with so many programmers in the room. That was a shock, and I, I'm really happy that you all made it to PDXCon. Go down to the careers booth, by the way, after this. <laughs> <laughs> we have positions open for gameplay and engine programmers. Um, cool. So it's actually pretty hard to, to put a really clear definition of a game engine down on paper. I thought about this for some time, and really it just boils down to being, it's, it's a set of frameworks, programming libraries, and tools to help you build games faster. That's essentially what it is. And it comes in all shapes and forms. And I think they break down into two categories, really. We have editor-first game engines, like Unreal and Unity, where the first thing you experience is you hit new project, and you're whacking your face. There's an editor. You don't have to be a coder. You can start putting things in the game, and designers can get quite far. And then you have programmer-first frameworks. And with that, if you're a designer, I'm afraid you've got to wait, because some coder has to come in and set things up first. And um, in a programmer-first framework, we're talking kind of more like a programming library. And you might have to use open source tools to sort of mix it all together. But you get a lot more choice of where you come from. So a lot of words here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, but just a really quick breakdown of the core elements of nearly every game engine. We have rendering at the top. So your game engine will help you to draw all of the action you want on the screen, all the UI, everything on the screen. It will help you draw that, regardless of what, whether you're running on PC, Mac, Xbox, PS4. That's the job of the game engine. 
All game engines will also handle your audio. Maybe you want to play some music in the background. Maybe it's just like a jukebox, like it used to be for CK2. Or maybe it's a bit more advanced, like we have an Imperator now, where we're using FMOD. Aha! Champion, thank you ever so much. Um, in CloudSwitz, we have a very strong GUI system. All engines have one, but we have a very detailed one. Um, the game engine will handle networking for you, so sending messages between computers if you have a multiplayer game. They typically have a suite of editors, quite often just a world editor, but sometimes a whole bunch more. Platform and console support, you all know new things are coming. We hear about streaming, we hear about consoles, we hear about all different platforms you can play games on. That's something which the game engine, uh, that's something which people who sell game engines will tell you the game engine handles. And for the most part, it does, until three months before release when it doesn't. And you're going, ah, why doesn't it work? But it does a lot more than if you build it yourself. Uh, and then input handling. Doesn't matter what keyboard or mouse or joystick you got. And this was solved 20 years ago. We don't care as long as we can get your input. Uh, so now we're going to look at CloudSwitz and just break down CloudSwitz into the parts. Super high level, what is CloudSwitz? It's a programmer first engine. You can't get started with a CloudSwitch game without a programmer at the moment, unfortunately. Makes prototyping a little bit harder to kick off, but it's, it's like Mark said, 56 different programming modules. It's very modular. Theoretically, you can turn lots of those on and off for different projects. Now, obviously, we don't have much of a game without audio, so we're not going to turn the audio off. But theoretically, we can actually set up a build, maybe for a tool which builds super quick, because we turn off 3D rendering, we turn off the audio, we turn off networking. We don't need it. Um, we have not as many modders as I thought we'd have in the room, but uh, the mod support is built into our game engine at, a, at an engine level. So we make sure that we load as much content as we can through scripting and files so that modders can go in and go wild and make their dreams come true in the CloudSwitch engine. Uh, we've decided to go down the route of having in-game editors instead of having separate editors. And that means that once we have the game running, our artists and our designers can all just bring up the console and start firing up the editor. And the, one of the main reasons we did that is so you guys can play with it. Right, you can just go off with Imperator now, type in Map Editor, and start painting terrain. And it's pretty cool, so have a go. Uh, and obviously, we have a lot of tools and frameworks specifically focused to our top-down map-based ground strategy games, which other engines don't have. In the last few years, we've been focusing on tools, something which used to come up quite frequently. People on the forums would say, why aren't you sharing your, your tools with us, guys? Come on, like we're modders. Just share your tools with us. I mean, you're just leaving us text files. Yep, that's what we had. <laughs> Sublime was our tool, basically, across the entire studio. Artists, when they wanted to put their model in, would edit a text file. When they wanted to edit the terrain and add a new layer to the map, it's a text file. So uh, we really were sharing our tools. It was just Sublime Editor, and that's all we had. Uh, but the last few years, we've really pushed to change that. We want to keep text files so it's moddable, but we also want to make sure that our designers can work efficiently. Uh, we've, hopefully, you've noticed an Imperator, a lot of upgrades to our graphics. We've moved to DirectX 11 and a more modern OpenGL, which allows us to finally have in-game resolution changing. <laughs> that was some years coming, I tell you. Um, there's also this guy called Jomini, which we're going to go into a bit more detail of in a minute. Uh, and we have a super, super powerful UI system. Uh, and one of the big changes we did in the last couple of years was make it so that the UI system is decoupled from the code that we're writing. So the code can just expose, like, here are all the things the game, the, get, sort of the user should be able to do through the UI. And the person making the UI can actually hook that in. So the code just exposes, here are the actions the user can take. And the UI, whoever's scripting that, can just say, that's the one I want to do. And the cool thing about that is, first of all, anyone who's modded UI in, in CK2 or EU4, it crashes a lot. Because if a button that you expect to be there isn't there, the game just freaks out and says, ha ha, screw you. I'm going to crash. That doesn't really happen quite so much anymore. It's, it still happens a bit. but. Not so much. Um, but it's also allowed us to build much more smooth UIs, which I hope if you played Imperator, you will have seen. Um, just wanted to super quickly mention, Mark did cover it. It's more than just the engine and tools team who make the game. We have a build team and an automated testing team. Uh, here's some of the things they do. They make sure we have Git. We have a system called Jenkins for running our builds. We have to automate all our uploads to Steam. Every time that we release 
a version or a patch for our game right now. You, all got, you guys all know that we've released Stellaris on the Game Pass, for instance, right? Whenever we want to release a version, we need Mac, Windows, Linux for Steam, GOG, our own store, Microsoft. That's 12 builds every single time. So we need computers to do this for us. Otherwise, we get mixed up. And we do sometimes. You might sometimes see the wrong version on the wrong store. That means the, the computer didn't quite work properly. Um, but then th those guys are friggin' awesome, as is the entire engine team. So if some of you are in the room, I think Per is. Yes. Thank you for your hard work. It always goes unsung in these sorts of things. So, uh, so here is a breakdown of Klauswitz. And it's probably a little bit small. I'll try and stand back. Um, I'm not going to go over absolutely every box. But I just wanted to give you some idea of the scale of our Klauswitz engine. So here at the bottom, we obviously have your operating system. Windows, Mac, Linux, which handles all of the kind of stuff that we don't really, we don't want to write an operating system to read to your mouse and keyboard. We just want to build a game. On top of that, we actually use a whole bunch of third party SDKs. So here we have SDL, which is a kind of Steam, I think, worked on it a long, it's, it was in Half-Life 2, it's that old. And it's come along over the last 15 years, and it just handles all the crap we don't want to handle. So we don't really want to worry about making a window appear on the screen and making so when you push this button on your keyboard, we read that. And it handles that, and it's great. If you're looking at making a game at home, now I know there's so many devs in here, I can drop these little hints in. Um, that's probably where you want to start. Um, obviously, we build on top of OpenGL, DirectX, and a whole bunch of other libraries. We also don't want to reinvent the wheel. If we need to read a PNG or a JPEG, someone's done that. And wherever we can, we'll take that code and incorporate it in. On top of that is the beast called Klauswitz. 56 different modules, different folders of code that we can turn on and off. And just to give you some highlights of what those are, we have recently built our core editors into Klauswitz. So I'm going to show you a screenshot in a couple of slides of our node editor. And this is the foundation for what might become kind of visual scripting in the future. This lets us build our game without having to edit text files. Um, we also have our UI system, which I've mentioned before, highly scriptable. Now modders can go away and go wild with the UI. And they'll do things that we haven't even imagined in it. And it's also templated so we can reuse a whole bunch of code over and over again without having to kind of make, oh, how's this button supposed to look? 700 lines of script. We can template that now and just use it over and over again. Uh, there's a whole bunch more stuff. I don't want to spend the entire time on this slide, even though it's interesting. But Klauswitz does a lot. And the idea is it's the glue between all the things your computers can do. Dep doesn't matter if you've got AMD, Intel, Xbox, whatever. The idea is whatever we want to run a game, Klauswitz will translate that layer into something that any game can use. On top of that, more recently, we built this for Imperator, and we're going to continue using it in the future. We have a system called Jomini. This is another collection of libraries, so it's programmer first. But Jomini allows us to reuse components between games without the dreaded Control-C, Control-V. So just a few years ago, whenever we started a new game, the first thing we did was say, eh, I guess it's a bit like Hoy. Copy, paste. <laughs> Got everything from the game. And then you're left with basically nothing. And then you have to rewrite a whole bunch of stuff. Now, we're probably still going to start new projects that way. But we're going to put more and more stuff into Jomini so that that copying and pasting job will hopefully one day not need to exist. And we'll just go, hey, new project, Jomini. We have a title screen. We have all the multiplayer stuff. We can't actually play anything. If you want it, this is where we have our map. So if we want to make a map-based game, Sure, the game's going to want to customize it and have more features later. But to start with, you have a map on the screen. You have some UI. And you have the ability to put content in the game. And this is also where our higher level editors live, such as our terrain editor. Because we're going to want to do that for most of our games. OK, not Stellaris, but most of our games. And then right at the top, I mean, we're here for this bit, really, aren't we? But right at the top, there's a game as well. And that's a lot of code, too. And that's. Um, made possible by all the, all the layers beneath it. And in the game, we obviously have kind of AI running. We have all the combat simulations, economy, all that stuff runs. Next. OK, so just to give you some highlights, some pretty pictures, good opportunity, uh, from Klauswitz. Mark said about editing much of our game by editing a text file and reloading the game. 
but I think this is even worse. Our artists, three years ago, when they wanted to make a change to our map, they would have to open up one of these, I think we had about 10, 10 or 15 bitmap files, and you're like, hmm, this mountain isn't tall enough. They would open up Photoshop, and they would paint this dot a little tiny bit whiter, and then they would load the game. And OK, like, let's be honest, that's two or three minutes, unfortunately. Um, and then they'd go, ah, now it's a tad too high. Close the game, come back in here, use a slightly darker shade of gray, and do it all again. That is not fun. <laughs> I, I played with it a little bit just to feel the pain, and I wanted to tear my eyes out. So, um, so we have gone and made our map and terrain editor, which means I can make a smiley face in the sea in under five minutes, which is pretty cool. Uh, no reloading the game. And not only does this mean that we can, we can build more content faster, but what's more important to me is that artists can build it better, because they're no longer getting sort of tired and bored of having to see this reload cycle, now they can just start painting away and the feedback is immediate. Which means instead of maybe, instead of touching up a mountain range 10 times, they can touch it up a thousand times in the same amount of time. So not only can we do more content, we can do better content and that's great. Um, on top of that, other things that you can go away with and play with right now if you want to after, the, well, maybe uh, this evening or tomorrow when you go home. Uh, we have a portrait editor now in Imperator, and some really clever people developed this system so that they have strings of DNA, which allows us to generate children by taking the DNA and merging it together. And we also have this super cool node editing system which at the moment we're just using for the particle editor. You can go away and play with the particle editor today. Um, and this allows us, this is a step in the direction we're going. It's a little glimpse into our future. And where we can, we're going to move more and more systems to use this so that we can kind of visually script what you're seeing in the game. So here we have a box that generates particles. And all of the settings can be edited with other nodes on the graph. And you can drag these around and run them through random number generators to make new particle systems without a single line of code. So we see more and more of our systems going this way over the coming years. And of course, any editors that we do, where we can, they'll be in the game. Great. 20 minutes. That's plenty. 20. That's oh, great. Cool. Yes. <laughs> well, that's fine. This is, um, this is the most exciting part for me, though. This is actually the reason why I became a game developer. I'm going to talk about what happens in a single frame in a CloudSwitch game. And I want you to bear in mind this entire time. And the reason why it amazes me so much, a frame is 1 60th of a second. And going forward, it's going to be less, right? How many of you have got maybe 100 or 144 hertz monitors? Yeah, that's probably twice as many as it would have been two years ago. And when it's 100 hertz, we have 10 milliseconds one hundredth of a goddamn second to run the simulation, draw everything on the screen, update the UI, oh, talk down the network, and let the operating system do whatever rubbish Windows wants to do in the background. And then we do it all again and again. And it happens a hundred times a second. So this is, this is pretty cool to me. And this is actually why I became a game developer. I'm like, this, this is the challenge I like, doing as much as you can in as little time as possible, preferably not doing any work either. Um, so what happens in a frame, super high level, first thing we do is we just read all the inputs. Maybe the operating system, someone's clicked a button somewhere. Maybe someone's pushed a key on the keyboard. Maybe there's a message over the network. We kind of gather all that information. Then the next thing is we update all the simulations. So this is the combat, the economy, any commands that have been sent over the network. We have to run all that. Then we decide how we're going to represent that to the user. What are we going to see? And then we actually give the operating system a bit of time to do whatever it needs to do. Um, and here's a super detailed breakdown. I try to pick the perfect level of, you don't want 7,000 lines of code, but you want a bit more than the four boxes you saw, right? I mean, so, um, so this is a rough breakdown of what actually happens in a single frame of a CloudSwitch game. And it's abstracted a little bit. So please, if you do apply for a job and come work with us, say that wasn't right, because it is close enough, right? <laughs> um, so the first thing we do is we give all the libraries, you saw that kind of bottom layer of libraries like SDL and Steam, we give them all a chance to do whatever they need to do. And that might take, you know, 0.1 milliseconds because they usually don't have much to do. Uh, then we just read all the input from the user, make sure they haven't pushed a key on the keyboard, or clicked the button on the mouse. And then we actually move from CloudSwitch into our new Germany layer, shiny new Germany. 
And here we let John Rennie do any updates it wants to do. So now we have a fancy new audio system, and we can do a lot more than just the jukebox like in the CK2 days. Uh, it has some time to maybe figure out how dramatic the music should be. If you've got a high, this is an example that we haven't done yet, right, obviously, but if we had this system in Hoi, the example we always give is if there's a high war score, maybe we can actually make the music slowly, slowly, slowly more dramatic. So that's all stuff that is offered by John Rennie now. And then we let Steam do whatever it wants to do. Maybe we need to trigger an achievement because you've finally done that thing you've been fighting for for a thousand hours. And then the game actually gets to do something, which is pretty convenient. Um, so the game will actually, so because we have a network simulation that needs to be the same across all devices, uh, the game will actually run everything as commands, one after the other. And we need to try and keep these in sync. Has anyone seen an out of sync error, maybe, in one of our games? I know they're pretty rare, but you know. <laughs> uh, that's generally when these commands don't act exactly the same on everyone's machine. So some little tiny thing goes off. Uh, then we process those commands, give the AI a bunch of time. That's actually one of the biggest time sinks in our game, especially because it can be such a variety of game states to consider. In Hoi, if Germany owns half the map, it takes loads of time to figure out where to move units. Um, then we just check any events. Loads of events in our games. We actually go through every single one, all like 300,000, and just see if any should trigger this frame. Um, then John Rennie does a bit more stuff. If you've moved the camera, it needs to do some math. And then we let John Rennie update any of its UIs it has. Then we go back into the game, update the map graphics, make sure that if your units have moved, the models have moved to a new province. Then we do UI. Then we come back to CloudSwitz. And it has to animate all those goddamn models that are doing this on the screen or whatever, holding their pike. And then it does the rendering of the graphics. Then we do the UI. And that's 10 milliseconds. One hundredth of a second. What the hell? Um, I Super quick, I'm not going to go into much detail on this slide, but I wanted to cover a topic that comes up quite often about why isn't Clausitz multi-threaded? <laughs> Surprise, it is. <laughs> but we have two, two problems to handle here. First of all, um, this is just a rough breakdown of what a frame might look like when you try and split it across six different cores or six threads on a machine. There's some green stuff that can happen at any time, right? Doesn't matter when in that 10 milliseconds this happens. So we can just kind of ignore those for now. But they are taking up time. But then usually what, ha what you see in a game is this section of blue tasks needs to be finished before this section of purple tasks, because one needs the other. And then you flip-flop again. And the problem and the reason why people don't think our games are multi-threaded is because of these gaps. And they're really hard to get rid of. Because we don't know how many cores you've got, how many lanes we have. We don't always know how long this purple box is going to be. So maybe we can sneak something else in here. But if we do and you've got a slower machine, suddenly your frames got longer. So I just wanted to give a really, really quick overview of why it's really hard to make the use of all your cores. But we try our best. And you can see here, there's some gaps, but we do a reasonable job. Um, maybe we'll just move to actual questions because I covered some of these in the talk anyway, because I was too excited, so. <laughs> we will repeat whatever question is there so, received. Yes, yeah, so. we should make a point of that. Cool. Fantastic. Yours was first. Very eager. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Ah, so the question was, are we going to be looking at Vulcan support? We are looking at it. <laughs> um, one of the things I love about Paradox is that unless we see something as a sales feature, I can talk about it, or unless someone's told me I can't. So I can tell you that we're looking at it, uh, but there's no promises, because we've run, some, we've run some tests to see if we can actually go in that direction, but we haven't committed either way yet. So, yes. Hmm. So the question, question was, if we look at the slide where you see the Jomini layer and the Klauswitz layer, where do we see the interface for modders? Yeah. And I'll let John take that. Cool. So I mean, um, I think the answer to that is twofold. We actually provide the scripting system which you can use to mod the game, i.e. the kind of tooling to mod the game within Klauswitz and Jomini. But the game itself has to make sure the systems that are built are moddable. 
So whenever someone makes, say, the combat system in the game, they can write all that logic in code and not load any scripts, right? Someone can just sit there and say, this is how combat's going to work, and that's that. Or they can choose when they build the combat system to actually say, maybe these values can be, can be written in a text file somewhere. And that's really useful because our design team can tweak them. So no longer does a coder have to tweak it, but the design team can. And the best thing is, then you can as a modder. And there was a real push in Stellaris specifically to move as many things to be moddable as possible. I think the resources at the top of the screen is the best example. Uh, first iteration and all our previous games, they were just in the game. So somewhere in code, you can have monarch points, these points, those points, and this. And there was no way to change that. And Stellaris abstracted that and said, hey, let's define these in a text file. And then whatever's in this text file, we whack at the top of the screen. So now modders can add their own currencies. Hey, let's have these weird types of minerals that don't exist in Stellaris. So it really is the interface is in the game, but the kind of the roots of it still has to be in the engine. So. Cool. cool. Yes. <laughs> uh, that, that's my desktop. <laughs> okay, my question is, how much of the work of your team is like features within the game? How mm -hmm. much is for maybe updates, dependencies, stuff at 11, and stuff like that? And how much is for new technology, black box, cool. and stuff like that? Okay, cool. so yeah. just to repeat that question, how much of our developers' work in the engine team is taken up by developing features for the games? Uh, how much is uh, maintenance, things like updating versions of C++ and underlying libraries? And sorry, what was the third one again? New tech. New tech. Oh, yes. How much is, is new tech for the core? Um, I don't know. This is, this is a hard one. This kind of lies between the two of yeah. us, so I don't know who should really answer. Um, I, I can certainly tell you that um, the, the work of the engine team is predominantly work uh, to implement new features that are requested by the game projects themselves. Um, so that's where a lot of work goes into. Um, work updating libraries in C++, I would say, is fairly minimal. Uh, like, there are always people trying out new things, uh, often as, as part of PDT. That's, we, we have personal development time at Paradox. Uh, people will often say, oh, I wonder what happens if I try and compile the game on, you know, this, that, or the other. Um, and then when it comes, sorry, I forgot the third one again. Uh, new tech. New tech, sorry, my mind is mush. Uh, <laughs> when it comes to new tech, we are actually, we already um, put aside, it's probably something like 10 or 20% of uh, development time into developing brand new tech, core tech for the engine. And we are looking at doing more and more of that as time goes on. And I'll just super quickly add, uh, you can see here our current team structure. Uh, we're actually looking at changing this over the coming year or two so that we split the engine team. I mean, we're hoping to make this box a lot bigger so there's a lot more people working on tech. And we want to split those between core technology, updating frameworks and libraries, but also working on new tech for games two years in the future, and having a developer support team who actually do the features that games need. So then this team will maybe double and then split into two. So that is our dream, to so have more structure for that. So All of these boxes should get bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, was there someone else? OK. <laughs> uh, should we take this guy? He's been yep. waiting. Yes. So, the, so qu the question on, was, yeah. uh, how good are we at backporting features into games that have already been released? I'll let John take this one. We are not great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reality is, uh, look how, how few people we have. Uh, uh, so these guys are nearly always working on upcoming or future games. Whenever a game is released, we just branch off the engine for that game, and then they, they kind of stay in a status bubble. But the tech leads on those projects do frequently bring new features in. So over the first year of a game being released, they'll pull in quite a few features. Over the second year, a few a few features, and three or four years down the line, the code is so different, it's, it's a lot of work to pull it in. So I would say kind of around release, quite good. Two years later, when we're doing more expansion work, mm. <laughs> but that also you know, gives you a reason to buy new games, right? So <laughs> cool. So that is all the time that we have for you guys currently. 
but uh, you have ample of time to ask them more questions. As you might have noticed, John's Cornish and Mark's <laughs> Scottish. So instead of meeting you, oh. we're gonna wait. <laughs> they interrupted your joke. Waiting for the World of Darkness team. Instead of meeting you in the meet and greet area, they're gonna meet you at the bar downstairs. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs>